Hi, I'm Dan Gelbart with another video in the prototyping series, and this time about metal 3D printing. So there's a lot of excitement about plastic 3D printing and about metal 3D printing, but in the long run, metal 3D printing will turn out to be much more important. And the reason for it is plastic 3D printing is mainly important for prototypes because once it goes to production, there are wonderful methods to make plastic parts in high volume, high quality, and low cost. For example, injection molding. But there is no such situation when you come to metal. Uh, it's true that low melting metals like zinc alloys, you can die cast. And die cast is similar to injection molding. If you want, if you don't know what die cast is, think of the old carburetor in your cars when cars still had carburetors. That's an example of a complex die cast part. Even a current car engine, there's lots of die cast parts. But this only works for low melting alloys, which are not very strong and are not very corrosion proof. Now, most uh, high performance metal parts are made of steel or stainless steel or special alloys. And those are actually difficult to manufacture and there is no real mass production method for them. Unlike the plastics, where there is an excellent mass production method. I know that uh, some plastic uh, 3D printing vendors are looking for production applications of their processes. And indeed, there are some niches where plastic 3D printing is suitable for production. For example, like tooth aligners, things like this, special helmets, special shoes. But in general, in plastic production is not a problem. In metal production is a problem because all the production methods which exist for metal are costly and time consuming. For example, CNC machining, investment casting, regular casting, forging. These are all uh, expensive processes, not just in tooling, but per part cost. That's why metal parts are so much more expensive. So metal 3D printing is so exciting because it opens up not just a prototyping method, but also a production method to make very complex parts at a, today not a very low cost, but on a trajectory of getting the cost lower and lower. So this is a general background of metal 3D printing. And I want to add a note that if you look at videos and demos of metal 3D printing companies, and if you are a machinist by training, you look at some of these parts and you tell yourself, why are they doing it in 3D printing? I can do it 10 times faster, 10 times cheaper on a CNC machine. So if that's what crosses your mind, you are right. Because many parts, for example, this is a wrench, like a nice demo of 3D printing. This is, these parts are all 3D printed. This is a locking plier, channel lock, 3D printed. But if you have a second look at those, you can do this part in 10 minutes on a CNC machine, and you can do this part in two parts, probably in 20 minutes on a CNC machine. And these parts, the fastest you can make them today on a metal 3D printer is about a day, because if they're sintered, they have to spend time in the oven. If they are uh, laser written, they have to take, take other time in finishing operations. So basically, a, a lot of the sample parts people show you metal 3D printed, you actually shouldn't. So there are uh, there is a category of parts where metal 3D printing brings enormous benefit. And if you think about it for a minute, the benefit is proportional to how much internal feature or internal structure there is in a part. Because if a part is without internal structure, you can clamp a plate, CNC machine it, and you are done. And this works for any metal, for plastic, for ceramics, and then you can fire the ceramics. And it's very cheap, very affordable. But the moment the part has some internal features, like if you look inside here, there's some cavity inside, 
And then you look at it and says, oh, I can't reach there with a tool because there are undercuts here. And then what do I do? So if you want a good finish, you can't reach it with a tool. You have to go to investment casting. Now, investment casting is a wonderful process, but it takes a month to get apart, and it's expensive because they have to set up some tooling. And also, even if you have the tooling, it takes a few weeks because it's done by putting layers and layers of ceramic and drying them and then burning out the wax and then pouring the metal. So it's, it takes many days. So again, if you compare these two parts, both are 3D metal printed, this can be done 10 times faster on CNC, while this can be done 10 times faster on metal 3D printing than the alternatives. And the more internal complexity you have, the more dramatic the benefit is. Say, so if I took a look here at a miniature manifold. Now, this miniature manifold is impossible to machine, even with EDM, because of the curved passages. Uh, it's too thin wall for regular casting, should be investment cast. And again, you're looking at several weeks and a lot of expenses to get an investment cast. And even in production, there is no other way but investment cast. And you can make a hundred of them on one tray in metal 3D printing, and it'll take one to two days. So again, anything which has internal complexity is a natural candidate for metal 3D printing. I know that the people who push metal 3D printing also push the kind of a design philosophy called organic design. This is like something a bit like this, but this is a simple example. Organic design means basically a part where all the surfaces have a natural free-flowing form. It sounds beautiful, but there's a bit of hype there because most of metal 3D printed parts need some post-machining. Like you have to bore precision holes. If the threads have to be accurate, you have to tap it. Now, if you have a part which is truly organic, free-flowing form, you look at it and say, how do I clamp it? And even if I can clamp it, it will distort. So you immediately have to metal 3D print special clamps, which doubles the effort, just so you can grip it on a machine tool. So, so again, you have to think about the real cost of this part, but in a nutshell, anything with internal structures is a natural candidate for metal 3D printing, like this, and also uh, something which is the opposite of machining. When you CNC machine, the thicker the sections, the faster you can machine it, because you can have a good grip on the part, you can run a big mill, high torque, machine a thing like this in minutes. Now, on the other hand, if you had to CNC machine this, it would be hours, because every wall is very thin, you can't grip it, you can't have a firm grip on it, you have to take very slow cuts, it takes a long time. Now, metal 3D printing is exactly the opposite. The parts which have very thin walls have very little metal deposited, so they go very fast. Like this would probably be two hours. Uh, on the other hand, the parts which are solid, like this, like this, will be many hours, maybe six, eight, ten hours. So, again, this favors parts with internal complexity, because internal complexity, meaning hollow spaces, makes it 3D print faster, while internal complexity makes it machine much slower and maybe not possible to machine. So that's a general introduction to where 3D printing fits in. And the most popular alloys today in 3D printing for metal is stainless alloys. And that actually makes a lot of sense because when you buy the metal in powder form, the cost of plain steel and the cost of the best stainless steel is about the same. So why make things of mild steel if you can make them from some wonderful steel like 17.4? It's the same cost and the same printing time, the same sintering time. Like when you machine parts, uh, some stainless steels are harder to machine. But when you 3D print, it's the same speed basically for everything. So why not use the best metal? And that you can see a lot of that. Therefore, much of the 3D printed stuff is uh, exotic alloys, which normally would be harder to machine, but here it's a natural. Okay, so that's a general background. 
And now let's talk about, before we get into the details, let's talk about the process that many of you heard the name, but I'm not sure if you really understand the process. And that process is called sintering. So let me insert here a very quick video showing uh, what sintering is. So sintering is basically taking a metal powder, shaping it to a shape, and holding it together very lightly with some binder or some pressure just to hold it to shape, and heating it up, and then the metal fuses together. The powder fuses together to a solid. So let's have a look at that video, a courtesy a website called Mechanical Tips. During sintering, parts are heated at a temperature below the melting point or range of the base metal, but high enough to metallurgically bond the individual particles. Sintering further densifies the parts, increasing strength. Okay, so sintering is a truly astonishing process. Because intuitively, if I take a pile of metal powder and I shape it to a certain shape and I put it in a sintering furnace at a temperature very close to the melting point of the powder, because in order for the sintering to happen you have, and to happen a reasonable time, you have to come very close to the melting point, maybe 20 degrees, maybe 50 degrees below the melting point of the metal. So you would imagine if you took a pile of metal powder, shaped it in some shape, which has to stay precise, heated it up for several hours to a temperature where it's near the melting point, which means the metal is very soft. It has about the strength of Play-Doh or plasticine at this temperature. You would imagine there would be enormous distortions when you take the part out. And especially if the powder is not uniform. In this video clip, the powder was drawn as perfect spheres. But imagine the powder is random shapes, random sizes. It's held together by a, a few drops of some binder just so it doesn't fall apart, put in a furnace, and amazingly, it shrinks uniformly in all directions to a very predictable shrink ratio and accuracy. And typically, you can get accuracies which are a fraction of 1%. It's not going to be as accurate as CNC, no matter what you do. Actually, no 3D printing method is as accurate as CNC, but it's a very respectable accuracy. And uh, no matter how complex the shape is, the shrinkage is uniform. And by the way, all the samples on this table were actually done by sintering. So you can see that regardless of the complexity, the, there is no visible distortion in the parts. So this is a very a non-intuitive fact. The other amazing thing about sintering is that it's one of the oldest processes in history. Because if you think of making ceramics, it's actually sintering. You make something from clay, and what happens in the furnace is actually sintering. And that part of sintering is, or that tradition, is 25,000 years old. And even metal sintering, it turns out, is thousands of years old the iron pillar of Delhi. That, it was, that was made about 1,500 years ago, and that is still the largest sintered object ever made. And it's quite amazing that is about seven meters tall, about six tons. It was made by sintering iron powder. There is no clear write-up how it was made, but metallurgists that examined it claim it was made by sintering iron powder. Now, the interesting thing about sintering is that because you don't have to reach the melting point, in many metals in the old days, people couldn't build a furnace to cast the metal, but they could sinter it. Because to cast the metal, you have to be 100 degrees or a couple of hundred degrees above the melting point. And sintering can happen at a couple of hundred degrees below the melting point. So if you make an object 
say of platinum, which melts at a very high temperature, uh, ancient people didn't have a furnace which can reach platinum melting point, but they could sinter it. And indeed, a lot of the Inca jewelry, which was found, was sintered, sintered platinum and sintered gold. And a lot of steel objects were sintered simply because people couldn't reach as a high temperature and a big enough size. So sintering is a very old art, and it is a natural fit with 3D printing. So basically, there are two methods of 3D printing metal objects. And I, I'm not referring to some esoteric ideas which cannot make any shape you want. There are some ideas in 3D printing, like arc welding, the position of wire, which can make shapes, but cannot make shapes with internal complexity. And as I explained before, the internal complexity is the biggest payoff in 3D printing. So I mainly, when I talk about 3D printing, I'm talking only about processes which can make any shape you want. So there are only two ideas in how to 3D print in metal any shape you want. And one idea is to take metal powder and deposit it only where you want metal. So obviously you have to mix it with some plastic or binder or something that you can deposit and build something like this from the powder. And then you sinter it. Now, a different way to build something up from the powder is to go layer by layer of powder and jet a binder, which makes the powder stick together only where you want. And then you brush off the powder, which doesn't stick, and you end up with the same object made from powder held together by a bit of binder. The binder is just some polymer, some plastic. So for example, this object here is a gear, which is printed with an FDM type printer from a metal paste. And if I drop it on the floor, it will shatter immediately. It has a strength of maybe chalk. But as long as I don't drop it, it keeps its shape. And if I put it in a sintering furnace, what comes out is something like this, which is an exact replica, but a bit smaller. Typically 16, 17% smaller. Now it's clear to see why it has to be smaller, because as the video clip showed, when you have metal powder, there are air gaps between the powder particles. If these air gaps were to disappear, the volume has to shrink. And the dimension has to shrink by the cube root of the volume. And since there is a lot of air space in powder, the ratio of the volumes is such that the object has to shrink about 17%, sometimes up to 20. If all the air disappears and the metal fuses together. So this is what it looks like as a green object before sintering. This is what it looks like after sintering. Okay, so to summarize, the first method of sintering is pattern-wise shape an object, typically layer by layer. You can lay down metal layer by layer and get this or this, or you can lay down a layer of powder and jet a binder only where you want the metal to the powder to stick together. But in both cases, you end up with an object which has metal where you want the metal and there's no other metal. And typically, as this is a basically build and center method. I'll talk later on about the advantages and disadvantages of each method. But there is a totally different approach uh, to making 3D metal parts. And that approach says, put the powder everywhere, layer by layer, but melt it together only where you want it to be solid. So in a nutshell, the first method is pattern-wise deposition of powder. And the second method is pattern-wise deposition of the energy. The powder is everywhere, but the energy is what makes the pattern. Typically, the energy is supplied by a fiber YAG laser, which is now the cheapest source of laser power. And the reason why it has to be a laser and not just a big furnace, because you have to focus it to a spot which will ride the pattern on the bed of powder. And this is shown in the next video clip. Direct metal laser sintering 
also known as DMLS, is an additive manufacturing technology that creates metal parts directly from 3D CAD data without the need for tooling. Let me start by describing in a bit more detail the, the, the method using a laser to pattern-wise deposit the energy. Here is a picture of a system made by EOS. This is one of the better known brands of uh, laser uh, 3D printing. Some of the people refer to this method as selective laser sintering or SLS, metal SLS. Other people refer to this method as selective laser melting, SLM. Now, in reality, what's happening is more melting than sintering because the time the beam dwells, as you can see in that video clip, is a tiny fraction of a second. And that usually is not enough to sinter if the temperature is below melting. Because in general, you use the word sintering when the temperature is just a bit below melting point, but this takes some time for the particles to fuse together. If you don't have the time, the temperature is just a bit above the melting point, and then it's really selective laser melting. But somehow the name selective laser sintering stuck. So both names are interchangeable, uh, it's basically taking a bed of powder, melting some pattern which forms one layer of the object, covering it with another layer of powder, melting another pattern, and YouTube is full of videos of these machines, so you can look at it. So, so far is the good news, because it looks like a very clean and nice process, which can work with many metals. But there's a bit of bad news. The, the two pieces of bad news that the systems are quite expensive in round numbers and installation is about $1 million. But there's another bit of bad news that all these systems need support. And here is a picture of what the part really looks like when it comes out of the SLS machine. And you can see there is a lot of support structures below the part. Now, some of you may wonder, why do I need the support? Doesn't the powder hold up the parts which overhang? And it turns out there are two reasons that you need the support. One reason is that sometimes you want to compress the powder a bit, so you, you can't just rely on the powder below to hold, but that's not the main reason. The main reason is when you melt layer after layer and the layers cool very fast, you build up a lot of stresses. Now imagine if you, any of you have done any welding. If you took a piece of sheet metal and you, and you cover it with welding, say with a MIG welder, and then you cover it with another layer and another layer and another layer, each layer will make the piece warp more and more upwards because you deposited molten metal in a flat, but when the metal cools, it shrinks and pulls it upwards. So anybody who welded has this experience, and the same thing happens in SLS. If you don't hold down all the parts with legs to a very thick base plate, the base plate is about an inch thick, so it cannot bend. If you don't hold everything down with legs, it will warp, completely warp, so you have to build legs under everything you do. But then there's a problem, how do you get rid of the legs because they're connected organically to the part. So if you have a part which is like this, and it's a simple part, uh, especially if you print it like this, you can come down and cut off all the legs and maybe cut out the legs here, it's not so bad. But if you have a part like this, and all this is full of legs, uh, you actually need a couple of extra machines in the back room to make the part. And the main thing you need is first you have to heat treat the whole part before you can cut off the supports. And this heat treating is in order to anneal the part, to take the stresses out, just like you do with welding. But the heat treating has to be done in an inert atmosphere so the part doesn't get oxidized. Basically, if you have a steel part and you heat it up to annealing temperature, it comes out all rusted. And even a stainless steel part comes out somewhat corroded. So you have to get a special furnace, which is called a controlled atmosphere furnace. And here is a picture of it. 
and, and these are quite expensive. And then you have to get a machine called the wire EDM, which I think most of you are familiar with. And the wire EDM is like a bandsaw where it has a very thin curve and can do any kind of steep curvature. So if this was a piece with support, the wire EDM is a wire which by electrical discharge will follow the contour and cut off all the supports. But what do you do if the contours are two-dimensional? What do you do, say, if you have this part and you print it like this? A wire EDM can only remove one dimension, and then you have to do another cut, and then you have to resort to the old-fashioned belt center. So basically, after the elegant first step, which is laser melting the layers, comes a bit of an ugly backroom operation, which nobody ever talks about. So when you go to a trade show and you see the laser printers, nobody tells you that this is just a first step. Then you have to heat treat it, then you have to take it to the back room and, and sand it and wire EDM it and spend a day finishing it. So that is the downside of the laser method, but it has many advantages over the sintering method. For example, it has a wider choice of metals available, and it is also not limited in size. The sintering method has some inherent limits, how big a part you can make, which I'll discuss later. But uh, the biggest drawback of the laser sintering method is actually price. By the time you price out the machine itself and the EDM machine and the inert uh, or the controlled atmosphere fairness plus other stuff, by the time you price everything out, it's around a million bucks. Plus, some metal powders are explosive, and you have to wear full respiration and full fire protection. It has to be a specially built room with special installations, explosion-proof room. So you can't just put it in your office next to your computer. These systems have to go in a dedicated room, special installations, special hail on fire extinguishers. So it's not for uh, basically small shop R&D labs. It's for production facilities. And indeed, the customers are those big production facilities, and the systems are very successful in making high net value parts, like medical, aerospace. But it's not really for the average workshop who just wants to prototype or average R&D lab. Okay, so I think this is uh, all what I need to say about the laser method. And now I want to talk about the sintering method. But before I want to talk about the sintering method, I need to do full disclosure, as they say. Because in all the previous videos, I had no commercial interest in any of the companies I mentioned. And uh, I, I believe the videos were very unbiased in terms of the equipment I recommended and so on. But this is different because I am a partner in a company by the name of Rapidia which actually makes a sintering type a 3D metal printer. So if you want to, uh, you are allowed to be suspicious of everything I say from now on, because I do have a commercial interest in it. Yeah. But I think that's okay, because I think uh, it's easy to do fact-checking on all these things. Okay. So let's start and explain the process of how a, a typical a sintering type system works. And again, the more a lower cost and more popular sintering type systems are really based on the standard plastic FDM printer. Instead of using loose powder, which is problematic, it's nice to bind the powder with plastic or bind it with some other uh, binder or with a liquid. So you can shape it without having metal powder all over the place, especially if you want to put the system in an office where you really don't want to deal with loose powder. Okay, so let's stop here and look at the Rapidia centric type system. So, uh, this is the Rapidia 3D metal printer, uh, which I believe, and as I said before, I'm probably biased, but I believe this is the simplest and lowest cost per part 3D metal 3D printer in the world. 
And I'll explain why I believe so. So the system has two parts. It has a printer, which is very, very similar to a plastic FDM, a plastic filament printer. And then it has a fully automated sintering furnace. The only thing you need to add, which is not here, is a tank of gas. So this, these systems typically use a gas which is 3% hydrogen with 97% argon. Uh, the low hydrogen is to make the gas non-flammable, so you are allowed to use it in an office or everywhere without any worry about fire. So uh, this is fed by a tank, which is not visible here, and the printer, unlike a plastic printer, which is fed by a filament, is fed by two cartridges of metal paste. Each cartridge is about uh, five kilo. Usually one of the cartridges is reserved for the metal paste. The other cartridges is reserved for a support layer, which also acts as a separation layer, and I'll explain later. Uh, the machine itself can take four cartridges, so if you want to have two other metals online, you can install it on the same base. The paste is pushed out from the cartridges by a hydraulic system, which is located inside. And actually it takes quite a lot of pressure to push out the paste because we don't want to put too much water in it because we want it to dry as we print. As you can see the pressure here, it's 250 PSI so close to 20 atmospheres to, to push out the paste through the hose into the print head, which has a metering valve which deposits an accurate amount. The rest of the printing, the setup and everything is basically the same as a plastic printer. So if you use the plastic printer with all its steps, bed leveling, printing and so on, you are ready to use this machine. Usually we print on a piece of aluminum foil here, I'll show you here. Uh, here, we, we take an aluminum foil and we put it on the glass plate and there is enough adhesion and by the time we finish printing, we just take the aluminum foil and we can peel off the printed part. You can also print uh, straight on the glass, you can also print on the transparent mylar sheet. It's not very sensitive to what you print on, but this is the cheapest any kitchen foil would do. Right now we are printing the third gear. That's the interesting part. That's actually a, a differential gear out of a Caterpillar tractor, which we downloaded from the internet. So it has, a, this, is a, this is a ring with the three planets. And one planet is sintered already, one is ready to sinter, and the third one is being printed right now. Okay. Once we have the two other planets ready to sinter, we go to the sintering oven. So all what you have to do on this part, just select the metal you're going to sinter. In this case, it's 17.4 stainless. It shows you the graph, what it's going to do to the metal. You don't care, all you have to do is push run. So we start the oven. There's a tray inside on which you put the samples. Now this one has a double tray, so you can put a lot more samples. Usually they come with one tray. Okay. Then, you put it in, close the oven like this and press run and you're in business. Now as you can see from this graph, it gives you a good idea how long it will take. The first is some preheating phase and then it ramps up all the way to in this case 1340 degrees C. It sits there for three hours. So this whole phase until the end of sintering is 10 hours, but then there is about 14 more hours to cool down until you're allowed to open the oven. The system locks the oven and doesn't allow you for safety reasons to open it until temperature reach 250 C. So in this case, it's about 22 hours for the whole cycle. And if you want to add a couple of hours to let it cool a bit more, 
It's uh, almost 24 hours. Now, uh, if, uh, if sometimes you can, for other metals, you have a shorter cycle because it doesn't have to get that hot. But in general, you can see if you print a part in the morning and you put it in at noon, by tomorrow noon, you have the finished part in your hands. So this part is very simple, very elegant. It uh, doesn't need any ventilation, just needs a little hose coming out of the building because as it sinters, some, some small bit amount of fumes come out and the fumes are mainly caused by the support. So let's talk a little bit about support. If I want to print a complex part like this, I need support while I print underneath all these elevated parts, but I also need support while I print inside the pipes. Okay, in this case, I don't really need the support for sintering because there are no big overhangs. If I had a big overhang, I'd also need support so the overhang doesn't sag in sintering. And that support would have to be made of metal, same as a part, so they shrink the same amount. But for many things, I just need support during printing, not during sintering. Mm -hmm. So we have two modes of support. One is metal support with a separation layer. Because if I put a metal leg and I put a bit of the white support material on top, that white material will prevent the support leg from bonding to the metal, so I can break it off by hand without any tools. But for most cases, I just need the printing support and then I don't have to waste metal. It's just the white material which evaporates during sintering. And I also don't need a base. Uh, many other systems require a raft or a base uh, before they can start printing the object, which also represents wasted metal. So because this system doesn't need a base and doesn't need metal support, for most cases, it is a lot more economical in metal. But uh, if you need the metal support, you just use the same material as a part with a white material acting as a separation layer. And this white material is what uh, is the need, what makes the need to vent it with a tube to the outside because it has to evaporate and disappear. It becomes gas, but the gas, we don't know if it, uh, we don't really know exactly what's in this gas, so it's best to vent it outside so you don't breathe it. Something very interesting about this system is that you can print complex parts with internal structures without any support. And the way you do that, you take advantage of the fact that the green part, the part I just printed, is water soluble. So if I wanted to make an enclosed bottle like that, I would need to I would need to print support inside so I can print the top. But there's another way to do it. I can print a cup and I can print a top and then I can wet the top until it dissolves a bit on the edge and stick it to the cup. And, and a lot of people are wondering, is that as good a bond as a printed area? And it is because the only thing which holds the paste together is the fact that there is water with a bit of binder and once you touch the finished printed part with water, it becomes printing paste again. So basically, there is no difference between the bonding between printed layers and the bonding between parts where you wet the edges and stick them together. And this way, you don't need to print support at all, which saves printing time, of course, and makes life a lot simpler. So these two parts were done like that, like this complex turbine, was actually printed as two turbines bonded together with water and sinter, and this was printed as two parts. And the same method allows you to do something even more interesting. It allows you to combine machined parts with 3D printed parts into one part, because machined parts are always cheaper and more accurate than 3D printed parts if they are simple. They don't have internal structure. So this plate was machined and this was 3D printed and I can use the same paste that is in the cartridges as an adhesive between them. So in order to do that, I have to pre-sinter the 3D printed part, put down the printing paste as an adhesive and re-sinter. And when I re-sinter, this, this, and the paste all become one piece. If you cut it, there is no bond line. 
because it's really the same metal, because after sintering, this is 100% solid metal, it's pure metal. By the way, in this system, we don't have to use infill. Infill means some honeycomb internal structure, which most people have to use. The reason why people have to use it is if they use a debinder. A debinder is a, a machine which boils solvent to remove the binder. Now, the reason we don't need this machine and we don't need to debind and we don't need infill is because it's a water-based paste where the water evaporates during printing and it leaves such a small amount of binder that it can evaporate in the furnace. So here is a demo how strong a part can be without infill when printed 100% solid. We're putting this part, which is a column, in a 100-ton press. A 100-ton, that's like the weight of 100 cars stacked one on top of the other. So because the part is now 100% solid, you can see the press pressure going up. You can see the top dial, which goes to 100 ton. It goes above full scale. It's over 100 tons, and the part can take the pressure without any problem. So to summarize, uh, let's uh, explain the advantages and disadvantages of the two methods available. One is the sintering method, as one is the laser SLS or SLM method. So in the sintering method, the beauty of it is simplicity and low cost. I mean, this whole system you're looking at costs less, uh, significantly less than $200,000 compared to a million dollars for a complete installation of a laser system. The basic system is actually a bit over 100000 but even with installation, spares, training, and everything, it's still well below 200000 And it doesn't need a back room with EDM or other operations. So basically, the attractiveness of this is an office-friendly, simple system, no solvent, no complexity, no special power requirement. So it's a very attractive system, but it has a fundamental limitation. And the limitation is the object size, because the part being sintered is quite soft. I said it's like Play-Doh at sintering temperature. So if you try to sinter something bigger than, say, a shoebox, no matter how much support you'll add, things will start sagging. Imagining making a block the size of a shoebox from Play-Doh, it will start flowing and sagging. So I don't know if that's a scientific measure, the size of a shoebox, and, but there is no hard and scientific limit to sintering size. It's just practical experience. And other processes which use sintering, like power, powder metallurgy, what's called PM, and MIM. MIM stands for metal injection molding. They also don't go to big objects for the same reasons. So basically, this kind of system works great for objects, say, this size. Maybe you can make objects this size, but you can't make objects this size. Just as a rough guide, of course, depends on the complexity. So even something like this, this differential gearbox is considered a large object for these systems. Okay, maybe you can make something twice as big, but that's about it. So the second disadvantage of these systems is that the choice of metals isn't as good as with the laser systems. So right now there is like four metals available and maybe a few more will come online. And it can also do ceramics, which is interesting, and I didn't actually talk about it before, but there seems to be not much interest right now in ceramics. So it doesn't have the full choice of metals a laser system has. So that's the two downsides of this approach. Now, let's go now to the laser systems. So the biggest advantage of the laser systems, SLS or SLM, whichever name you use, is they can make an unlimited size object if you buy a very expensive and large system. But systems are available both with lasers and electron beams, because another source of heating can be electron beams. Systems are available with lasers and electron beams, which can make objects which are multiple meters in size. Of course, these systems cost multiple millions as well, but there is no theoretical limit how big an object can be made in the other systems. The disadvantage of the SLM-SLS systems 
is, as I mentioned before, they're quite expensive. They cost about a million bucks uh, uh, for a basic system, in, if you include the backroom equipment. And uh, after the elegance of the unit, you have to go to a backroom with uh, fairness, with a wire EDM, with belt sanders, files, and a whole bunch of messy operations to clean up the part. So that's the downside. And also, of course, the time to make an object because of the backroom operations is much longer than the time the machine itself takes to make the object. So this is, in a nutshell, as the downside of the laser systems. So basically, there are two, almost two distinct markets. One is served best by the laser systems, like aerospace, which are or medical which mainly like to use titanium and like to make large objects. And another market is more R&D, prototyping, educational market, a small part production, which is served best by these types of systems, whether the metal is deposited by FDM or the metal is deposited by binder jetting, which is a faster process. A binder jetting system is roughly in between price-wise between this system and a laser system. In general, even a binder jetting system with sintering is cheaper than a laser system and much faster. So, so these are the, the three choices which exist basically right now. Of course, if you want to know more about Rapidia, you can go to the website and look up more things. And that's it. Thank you very much.